Hello, viewers. Welcome back, or welcome for the first time to DWeb Decoded, the podcast stroke vidcast stroke video thing uh, that looks into where we've been in the decentralized movement and re-decentralization movement uh, on the web and in Web3, and where we're going with some of the people who are taking us from the sordid past into the brilliant future. And I'm joined today by one of those people. Uh, it's Max Cohen, who's editorial director at the Museum of Crypto Art, better known as Mocha. Uh, and also uh, one of the hosts of Mocha Live, which is where we met. Like this is a cross, this is one of those crossover uh, episodes, right? My first like, crossover these, episode. Really? Oh yeah. man, I love those when like people's favorite characters. So, okay, let's like, I went into the Mocha Live thing without really, like I did the research that I'm sure you did for this, where I'm like, okay, I'll just listen to some podcasts. I was like, holy cow, these people are in like deep art, yeah. net art world, scandals, not so scandals, like where are we going, like wrangling. So what what's the idea of Mocha Live? Um, well, yeah, I mean, there's like a conceptual idea, then like a pragmatic idea. The pragmatic <laughs> idea is less sexy, but basically like everything that we were doing on a content side was on Twitter and Twitter is just a, um, a nightmare. I refuse to call it by its new name. So I'm going to refer to it as Twitter for the, 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 the social media platform formerly, formerly known as Twitter. Yeah, Twitter yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like all this writing and things that we were doing, Twitter will just eat it if it doesn't like it and it decides yeah. what it likes, you know, every week anew. So we were like, we need rain. to, yeah. I know it's, it's bad and it's only getting worse. So we, I needed a way to be able to talk about things and break down, I don't know, all sorts of issues and topics that was outside of like the yoke of the Twitter algorithm. So I was like, podcast, great, lives outside of Twitter. Crypto art loves preservation, but we have a preservation problem because it exists on social media predominantly. So all of this stuff just ends up in the torrent of you know the raging river that is all of this content so yeah i always have an angle towards like what is the five ten years from now what does scholarship and research look like in a crypto art right if this movement right. is as important as i think it is and as a lot of people in my world think it is then there's naturally going to be art historians who are looking for nitty-gritty details about what this is and because it gets lost so quickly on social media we were like let's do this podcast we can talk about really in-depth nitty-gritty topics every week and then, I don't know, maybe five, 10 years from now, some art student who's doing a thesis can look back and say, okay, I know, I can see all these things this that moment. are happening. Yeah, this moment, every week on this, like, and, and listen to people's in-depth opinion, who, you know, hopefully we're in the know a little bit about it. So that was kind of like the conceptual underpinning of why I thought that this was I have a, an intelligent. I have, an, I have a friend, Becca. Uh, Valentine, who is on Twitter and has been banned several times, actually. Um, uh, and Becca does this weird thing, correct thing, of she goes and listens to podcasts from the early, well, I guess, mid 2000s, like yeah. the first set of podcasts. So she listens to these things that are called things like IT tech conversations with Clay <laughs> Shirky. Uh, you know? And I'm like, holy cow, no one listened to those at the time, right? They were just like, you know, bloviating. Yeah. Uh, same here, I guess. But, um, <laughs> But she gets, they get like a really good like take on what was happening at the moment because it's that it's that thing of like going through the front page of a newspaper. It, yeah. It doesn't necessarily tell you their history that we know, but it tells you what people thought was going on at the time. So I'm hopelessly addicted to sports podcasts. Like that is my uh, mm -hmm. terrible addiction. Like I love sports and it's, you know, things change so quickly. The legacies of these players based right. on accomplishments, accolades that they may have gotten this year totally changes how we think about them, speak about them. Podcasting in the sports world has been huge since, you know, the like late aughts with like yeah. Bill Simmons and Grantland. And like, that was a huge, right, right, right. Uh, yeah. Like revolutionized how, like what kind of information people were capturing on these podcasts. And if you go back to these archives, they're talking about these players in a completely different way. And you get to kind of see the legacy evolve in real time as somebody who came to sports too late. Like I didn't get to see right. so many of the things that I would love to. It's right. a fascinating way to like get involved in the conversation or at least understand the conversation as it was evolving. 
Yeah, it's cool. I, yeah, I, I it was it's so kind of what we try and do in this, and uh, you know, I was I was saying before we came on, like I end up try, focusing a little bit on the history because I'm old, but part of it is is trying to isolate these threads that go through things. This is really interesting because this is kind of what we were talking with Kalani uh, Nicole about in the last episode. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we kind of veered off and went super, super meta as you are with, you know, a great art critic, right? Like yeah. it was like, okay, how do we get from this to higher level? Um, and very meta. But there is this meta feel to it, right? Which is so much of the... Web3 art scene is, uh, I, I want to choose a term that isn't kind of condemnatory, right? Like mm. it's about fashion and vibe and about mm -hmm. like, you know, the Taste. moment, right? Yeah. Um, and how do you preserve that for the long time? How do you give it the same length of time as art traditionally takes to survive? Um, yeah, it's like the unknowable question. I mean, I mean, I I think that like one of the issues we have in crypto art as we're like involved in this evolving movement is that we don't have a similarly detailed idea of how these other art movements of the past how right. they like also developed. You know, you can go in the history of the surrealists, and obviously, you know, there's probably three or four people that everyone knows off the top of their heads: the Dalis, the you know, Leonore Carringtons, the um, Max Ernst, whatever. It's like I, I always am faced with the question of like w that could not have been the only people, these big names that were involved yeah. in this movement at the time. But you're reading the history and you're learning the history, and so then you are believing the history as it is told through you know this one critic's book or this one you know art movements of the 1900s like compendium and right. it's leaving out so much of the nitty gritty so like we don't know in real time what's going to be important right what people like i said five ten years from now what they're going to think is interesting it might be stuff totally under the radar today so i said yeah. i sense we're going to go so we, i sense we're going to go all over the place on this in a good way so Great. i want to just quickly highlight at the beginning like what is Merka doing with falcoin and like what do you like <laughs> do the 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 uh connection between kind of what we do in the d web uh falcoin foundation yeah right? so you know i i invoke him all the time i think i invoked him on the episode that we did with you on, on the Mocha Live pod, but right. like Art Gnome, uh, Jason Bailey is the patron saint of this entire movement. And right. the like hill that he has chosen to die on the last couple of years is that none of these NFTs, none of these art is safe because where it's stored might be these private servers. And if whoever's hosting the server runs out of money, then the metadata is gone. That's happened right. to some pieces in um, the museum's own collection. They were hosted on sites that you know went bunk in 2020. And so now we know what they look like, but the actual piece itself is corrupt it's, there's no telling what circumstance is going to lead to that happening you know we in, it's i like think october Herculaneum. it's like ancient rome where you sort of go. <laughs> I, yeah, we, we have some hints that there was an ape at this point but yeah <laughs> yeah i mean we we know that like it's it's a time bomb right we know things are going to be lost but we don't know what they are so right. we're a museum right we're not a physical museum, so we think a lot about like what an executional as opposed to an institutional museum is. But at our core, we are a compendium of artworks and artists that we think are important. It's not all stuff that we decide on. We have like a huge collection of just community activated pieces. It's like 9,300, 9,400 pieces. It's really important to us that those artworks and then what was being activated into our collections at any given time, like that's kind of vital information to know what we were doing at what time, to know when people got involved in our ecosystem, to know what they thought was important and worthy of curation at any given time. I, so we needed an archival solution, right? And there hasn't really been a good one until we, you know, partnered with, with, with y'all at Filecoin and like the ability of having this comprehensive, permanent and trustworthy, like backend so that every piece in our collections all of the various ways that like our community has decided to express itself, that's just preserved, right? So just as I, I'll keep talking about the five, 10 years in the future, but we've never had an art movement before where you can see what people were interested in every single day. 
Yeah. And I think that that is so fascinating, right? I, I have no idea how useful that will be, if useful at all, but I can't imagine that somebody who cares deeply about this subject in the next decade is not going to look at like the work that we do internally to preserve this artwork and not find some interesting nugget of information about it. And then the, the file coin backup system is just like, it's everything, right? That's what allows us to archive this stuff. It's what allows us to go to our community and say, Hey, if you want to preserve these pieces, not just the fact that they were in the museum, but also their metadata so that they don't have corrupted imagery that gets lost. Like that's a, a, a monumental sell. Yeah. to why people should care about what we do and a monumental communication that we're serious about what we do. So it's, the, it's pretty monumental. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 it's like 11 minutes in, so it's time for me to mention AI. Like the other like, thing about this is, um, you know, we, we talked earlier about like imagining a student kind of looking through, peering through mm -hmm. this podcast. And it's so high. Um, hey, uh, hey, it's good. I hope everything's not too hot where you are. The, um, <laughs> uh, but of course, like it's also fuel to these AIs. Like I mm -hmm. was playing around, like, of course we're all playing around with these, these tools. And I'm like trying to work out how I can feed the freaking endless, uh, web three crypto documentation into a form that I can actually pass. And uh, with rag and, and, and stuff. And like the key thing here is, is that it's pretty good at like pulling out information from a huge heap from this mm -hmm. giant haystack, but the haystack has to exist. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the more context you have, the more it is able to like take you on this, this voyage. I mean, going mm -hmm. back to what you said about previous art movements, I had the same like, as a extremely minor player in very big movements, right? Sure. Which I I don't want to like. As one of those myself, I yeah, understand. Right? Like, I think I, I feel the commonality here where you're going. Well, I'm not like the person. Emphasis extremely right? minor. Right, right. But I'm I'm in it, right? And um, and I can see stuff. And like, there was always a phase in like Web One land where I was like. Should I be, should I be writing the book? Should I be like taking, cause there's always some guy or woman, uh, uh, who is like years or later. Yeah. Or otherwise. Right. Um, who publishes their diaries or their footnotes or whatever. And it's a gold mine, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh yeah. Met with Samuel Pepys and he was an idiot or whatever. And, um, it's like the diary of uh, Madame Pompadour. Right. And, uh, and, and one of the things I like about digital movements is there is this hope that you preserve everything at this, at this granular level, right? Like, you know, there is a viewpoint on history that if, if it plays out, the fact that everything on Facebook is recorded, right? All mm -hmm. of those conversations, including those private conversations, right? Um, and, that is a history that is so powerful that the last thing you want is for like one company to have it. Mm -hmm. Um, but the second worst thing is for it to vanish entirely. I don't know. I don't know what the well, order well, of that a, is. Right? Well, there's a middle ground between that, right? You know, I, we spoke about Eric Hughes when you were on Mocha live, like Eric Hughes is like the patron saint of all you know, crypto, everything, right? It's about the ability to choose what you are exposing to the world. I think that yeah. that's really important, right? It's great that everything's documented, but you should have a say in what you're documenting. So we don't want to like, we don't want to preserve everything in everyone's wallet. That's not for us to do. But like what people choose to express themselves with, what people choose to curate into like our rooms, uh, which are these like 3D metaverse galleries, like if people are choosing to, put the bits of themselves in the world we want to make sure that we honor that choice that they make and not any choice that they haven't made this so is like, this is a conversation yeah this is a conversation i have with Kalani, which is so when you're recording when you're creating your 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 um collection in the do you work with the artists or are you just kind of like scraping and grabbing it and then storing it 
Do you so ask for we, permission or forgiveness? We have a, a couple of different collections. They all kind of have like different ethoses. So the big the one the one that like I've spent the most time going through is the Genesis collection. So the idea behind this one was pieces from every artist or one piece from every artist who was minting on the blockchain before I think December of 2020 um, with a little bit of give and take there, right? Just a record of who was doing this before everything blew up in 2021. Right. So that came about a bit before my time, but my understanding is that it was a collaboration between the founders of the museum. Uh, that would be like Renee Schmidt, Shivani Mitra, and Colborn Bell, uh, pieces that they had collected, and then also donations from other collectors who wanted their pieces represented, and artists who want their pieces represented. And we still field um, requests if anyone has a piece that they minted before that time and they want to be in the Genesis collection, like more power to you. We have a collection that um, the esteemed artist Daim al um sent to us. And it's this collection of all these kind of artists from backgrounds that aren't generally centralized in the art world. So it's a lot of like a lot of women, a lot of minority folks, a lot of people from the global South and like their works. Those are things that we've kind of like, it's not that we go about seeking it, but they kind of like get vetted by us. We say, yes, we would like this. And then it comes into our collections. The community collection is completely hands off because I think it's kind of gauche that a museum would think of itself so highly that it should determine the direction of art history. That's kind of not what this art movement, like a mm -hmm. decentralized art movement is all about. That has to be a part of it, right? Because there, every, if you're going to have a museum, you have to have some kind of taste making ability, but that needs to be weighed by the others who are involved in this movement who are not like, physically involved in the organization. So the community collection is completely hands off. You know, when I first came on, it was full of PFP projects uh, because that was what most people had in their wallets at the time. We're never going to say don't activate stuff in the collection. We want as much artwork, as much you know, media that people think is important um, whenever. So, I mean, it's a, it's a balance, right? We don't like want to go scraping through all of crypto art, but we want to give people the opportunity. Like the way we scrape through is by giving people the opportunity to give us non-custodially. The community collection we don't own; we just kind of display and preserve. Like the folks around us who care about what we do, they should be deciding as much as we are what is in this collection. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's kind of no. Like the I think it does. Behind. I mean, I think I think that there are like a few different things to tease apart. Right? There's sort of how do you, and I'll skip this one a bit because we talked about it so much with Clarny, is like, how do you prepare a piece of digital artwork, right? How do you, how do you convey it to a next generation in the way that it was, if that's the aim and how do you decide whether that's the aim? But then there's well, this other thing about well, present, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that's a, a that whole conversation is a non-starter because none of this art is visible in the way that it needs to be. The, the oh, big problem right. with crypto art today is that the technology to display this stuff is not there. It's not close to there. You know, even if you get one of these like seven eight hundred dollar token frames or Lagos frames or whatever it is, like first of all, prohibitively expensive to begin with. So you know, I don't know what one percent of the one percent is going to be able to actually afford those, but they don't work very well. They don't fit to aspect ratios. Like we d we don't have a solution right now to seeing this work. So we're kind of like waiting for that to happen. I, I, VR, I one of one of ideally. the things that struck me and I kind of liked about Mocha Live was like I was looking. You know, you always when you go on something, you're always like, oh, is it going to be really like hard questions, or whatever? And um, you had a whole like absolute demolition. I won't mention any names of like an exhibit of nfts that was just like this column oh, the <laughs> just, uh, don't say no no you can say what it is yeah but like it was and you were just going this is a terrible presentation and like honestly i'd never thought about that right i'd but never you have thought to also about have empathy for the people putting it together because right. what options what? are at your disposal if you don't have you know, $150,000 of disposable right. income to go rig a projector in like a warehouse space like it's right just right and, and we were talking off camera, and we should have done it on camera, about the uh, Apple Vision Pro, right, mm -hmm. which we both kind of glommed, um, looks at, and talking about the, the, the vividness of things in that. I mean, I think that there's an escalation, right? I had a similar but very different reaction when I first put on, like, you know, uh, uh, an Oculus or whatever. But 
but the, the, I guess what I'm trying to drill in here is you're sort of saying that there is a uh, a kind of optimum way of viewing digital art which we haven't even achieved. It's not about like replicating how it was first mm -hmm. con conceived of. We haven't got to the point where you can see these things in the way they should be. Is that, yeah. is that because of the context or is that because of the mm -hmm. technology? I think it's both. So I'll throw an anecdote at you. So I've been lucky enough to interview the like incredible artist and collector and Spalter uh, a number of times. I remember she was telling me a story once um, of going into an art gallery somewhere in New York, I believe, and seeing it was just a, your. I, I think she she went seeking out the work of a specific digital artist, and his work was in the back on like a screen, kind of away from the canvases and stuff. It might have been in the aspect ratio and to the resolution that the artist had decided was appropriate, but again, the context isn't there. We're talking right. about digitally native works, right? That right. exist. Uh, they're born into the world. Using digital processes, they're minted on on the blockchain, which is like a super advanced digital product that is really hard for even me to understand. So, it seems to already be a bastardization of the artwork if you're going to force it into a mold and a place that it's not native to. The Vision Pro and other metaverse devices are really interesting to me because it allows two things, right? It allows a the work to be seen in whatever resolution with whatever animation it's created with in whatever aspect ratio it came into the world as because you're not limited to a specific physical screen. But the other side is like, it also allows the owner of that artwork choice into how they're viewing it. You can, I mean, uh, again, we're talking about technology that isn't there, but in a world that like with this vision pro where you can kind of map things to your physical space, map screens and such, you can have a sculpture um, there's this wonderful VR artist named Metageist who has been creating VR sculptures for quite a while, years and years and years. And you could have that blown up in the center of your foyer if you want, or you can have it very small on your desk. And there should be some kind of unspoken collaboration between the artist, the owner, and the technology that allows for all of the interested parties to have their wishes fulfilled. But right now, nobody's wishes are being fulfilled. The tech, again, the technology isn't there yet. But I do think that, uh, yeah, ideally, the advent of VR and AR is going to allow us to see these works in a, in a way that makes sense. You, know, you take a Vision Pro in the distant future to a museum, you're not just seeing the pieces that are physically on the wall. You're seeing whatever's curated in the space. And that could be it's limitless possibilities there. And I think well, I, I, another thing that's sort of interesting in that is there's there's a... I wouldn't say inevitability, but there's a certain direction, right? That mm -hmm. all of this stuff is 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 going in, and uh, it's always interesting to talk to someone when they say, "Oh, you know, this looks like this now, but in the future, this will look like you." You see, like we were both saying that the Vision Pro, should you be choosing whether to buy it, is kind of a dev kit really at this point yeah. like it, it intimates what it is very well but it's not it's not there yet but you as soon as you see it like buying a mac for the first time or an iphone you go oh i'm gonna go this way now yeah it's a crystal ball is essentially right. what it is right did you feel so how did you get involved in crypto art like did you is that what drew you in where you went oh man this is the future uh, no, it's super happenstance. So I've spoken a ton on my podcast and I'm, I'm not ashamed for what it's worth, <laughs> but I am wary. So I, my first NFTs were all on Solana. They were all PFP projects. That's there were things that I was to be ashamed of uh, for a bit. Everyone tried okay. to make me ashamed of it. And I okay. resolutely refused, but I was basically just gambling with JPEGs. Uh, I, right. I wanted to make a buck. It was I was an out of work writer, and I didn't really have an income stream. My unemployment had washed up, and here was an opportunity to make some cash. Uh, I had a really serendipitous meeting with um, Shivani Mitra, one of the founders and uh, curators of Mocha. She's just a wonderful person and a great friend. And over the coming months, an opportunity arose for me to write about a bit of art, and I kind of just found myself in this wormhole. And on the other side was this world that I had never imagined could exist. And I was 
yeah, the, the more I wrote about it, the more I looked into it, the more people I interviewed, the more folks I listened to, the more I realized there was this like blossoming, burgeoning history uh, as, of something that existed so far on the cutting edge as somebody who's never been on the cutting edge before, as someone who always comes into a workplace just right. after it was great, you know, all the, the restaurants the I worked at. scoop kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. So yeah. it was, yeah, I mean, every day it's just, it's fascinating. It's oftentimes emotionally taxing, but I love it. So do you, I think one of the qualities of digital, of digital culture, right? And, um, and I feel this about the D-Web and it's something to kind of both escape from and celebrate is um, I think digital culture, because it runs at the speed of the technology advancing, has this very quick nostalgia to it. Like, mm. I remember, like, when I started getting this pang for, like, video games I played, <laughs> like, you yeah. know, and, like, I'm watching my uh, my kids, and uh, my, my kids are at college now, and they came back, um, and uh, I was like, oh, what are you doing? They're saying, oh, we're kicking up the Minecraft server. And, you know, it's like kind of we're going to go, you know, to our old bar or whatever. And um, are you, is part of what you're trying to do, trying to recapture a moment in your life, like that moment where, like, it was extremely exciting then? Or is it to kind of keep mm -hmm. on that cutting edge? Like once you've got there, like that's the that's the thing that you want to keep on trying to uh, preserve. Does that make sense? It's it sort it of does. Like, yeah, yeah. It it's it's a balance between those two, and I think never consciously either one. I think that there is an addictive quality to being on the cutting edge. There's yeah. an addictive quality Tell to like ex experiencing AI. Right. I, I know way too much about AI for somebody who's an art writer. Like I know more about it than I'm in the 99th percentile of people who know about it. And I'm in the fifth percentile of people in crypto art who know about right. it. And that's a fascinating dichotomy. So there is being in this accelerated space. There is something that is, especially as a writer and like a cultural analyst, which I suppose is what I am most days. I'm afraid you like, are now. I'm sorry yeah, to say I, it, but I, yeah. I, I never wanted to be here, but here we are. Maybe you should but go like, back to gambling. It's a, it's a more honest trade. I, I've thought about it. Um, yeah. It's definitely an older trade. <laughs> um, but yeah, I like, it's hard to, it's hard to unmarry oneself from the cutting edge when you know where it is and what it looks like. I think that what I'm trying to do is help fill a void that, for me did not exist before I came into crypto art, which is that like, I'm late to this. I was not there at the beginning. I was not there in its formational stages. I came in at the very peak and then watched it kind of like fall apart for two years into a bear market. And I am very lucky in that through Mocha and through the people that I know, I've been able to form a pretty comprehensive idea of what this whole thing looked like. But I'm also incredibly lucky. I have I've been blessed with a lot of things, but one of those is like the connections in the space, these people who I can turn to. The fact that I host my podcast with Colborne Bell, who's been collecting crypto art since 2017, 2018, who's like one of the most like foundationally important figures on the collection side of this movement. Like that's just a wealth of information that I have literally available to me every day. I think about the, all the people coming in now, the people who've been coming in through the last year, the people who will come in in the future on whatever side, right? The cultural side, the artistic side, the development side. I want ideally for there to be a better compendium of what this all looked like, like in real time for those people, because that would have been really helpful for me. And also like everything we're trying to do is to not mimic the like exclusionary tendencies of art movements beforehand. And one of the things that is most exclusionary is that narratives have been formed in these high castles and then postured to the populace said, this is how things were. Now, I don't want to say this is how things were, but I do want to give people the opportunity to learn how things were and interpret for themselves and not have to go digging super deep for it. Again, that's like a, the subtext. Of my, it's not something I'm thinking about every day. No, no sure. The, but, it's, an, it's an open question to me about... So my presumption was that one of the reasons why you had that voice from the canon or dictating not only what the story was, but what should be preserved 
what should be what should be uh, what should be stored long term is came from a position of scarcity right Absolutely. like you got to choose right like are we gonna store everything or are we just gonna have like the christian books well, but also like do the there's only books. so many people who were there when like de kooning had his first exhibition right wherever right right there was only i don't know uh, how many people that were there and also had the know-how wherewithal foresight to capture that so you're forced i like i don't think anyone was doing anything wrong this is how the system worked you had physical artworks in a physical location that could only hold so many people those people generally came from the same set they probably had similar backgrounds the story was formed by like you said the scarcity itself well if we don't have a scarcity problem then how do we like mimic that on the storytelling side right and it's right, just right. And it's just the glut is the answer moreness give yeah. me as much information as possible yeah and then you can combat the narrative the and single narrative I, I, and i think maybe what what happened so i thought what would happen no scarcity anymore we would have like you know a million stories and that would be great you would find your own way in particular i wanted this i wanted to record stories of failure because those mm. were the ones that didn't get i think you sort of touched on it earlier right where um you would always hear about how people succeeded and the biographies of the great, the great and the good. Right. But you would never, you know, the number of biographies there were of someone who, you know, just had a life or, you know, died when they were 13 or something wasn't going to exist. And now you were right. Because people would be writing in this, this way. Um, I think in some ways what's happened is you still get a battle of narratives, right? Like you can mm -hmm. feel now, that people are, I mean, maybe this is a question because I don't know, but do you feel that there is a fight for the narrative of what happened in the NFT boom? Right? Well, it's are also, people, it's, it's, yeah, it's so subtextual, but yes, it's, uh, it has to be there because we, again, we live and work in crypto art in an ecosystem based off of Twitter and Twitter is a star system of like, it's a gravitational pull towards Right. The most influential, the highest followed individuals, their words are going to be able to reach more people. Their narratives are going to be more sprawling naturally. They'll always be like single perspective, but I, I don't have an answer for this yet. I'm fascinated by the question of like, what does an art movement look like when it's connected to a social media service? But what we've seen is that like we've seen a consolidation at the top of this art movement by artists who can routinely sell for five, six figures deserving or not i that's not my place to to say like a right. lot of these people are wonderful creative brilliant artists but the fact of the matter remains are they the best artists are they the most indicative of this movement sometimes yes sometimes no and that how do you how do you yeah. shift people up and down the curve right like that's the that's the the other question because like success breeds success and that's one of the reasons why you get these peaks but it also means that it, it probably is less problematic if, like, those kings can be deposed. Like people, you know, the the the, the thing moves around. Um, but yeah, it's impossible, I think, to to really get away from it. Even myself, like doing, you know, I I hope a fairly okay job of giving light to folks who don't normally have light on them. Like I only know what I know. I'm only right. aware of who I'm aware of, and I can only you know recite from memory the artists who I can. So I myself am a single narrative that is not indicative of the space itself. The beauty of the decentralized movement is that I can't, nor should I be, the only voice. That's the ethos of the museum, right? We have the a Genesis collection that has 300-ish pieces in it. That's our perspective. But you always have to be introducing the perspective of the masses who may not have the platform, but their perspective – and what they know is equally valuable. In fact, it's even more valuable because the point of the thing is the muchness and it's in the glut. So like I, I can't do a very good job of it because I'm only one person. The museum can't do a great job of it because we're only one institution. You have to provide the tools for the muchness to be seen and to have an opportunity to express itself. There's no way so, to avoid it on social media. Yeah. So going to the social media thing, so one of the themes, definitely preservation is one of the themes, I mean, unsurprisingly, with the Falcon Foundation. Um, but um, uh, one of the other themes that sort of accidentally happened around this is that I think we, we launched, this podcast launched 
as a Twitter space. And then mm. we went, oh, that's kind of awkward. Yeah. Um, and then uh, uh, we, a lot of the early people we got on were folks who built, helped build Mastodon and, mm. and Blue Sky, of course, right? Sure. Um, and so, um, so a lot of the questions are always like about that. How do you move off a platform and how do you preserve a vibe? Right. I think it's fair to say, I think that Blue Sky has, I'm, I'm like, you know, master on kid at heart because I'm like free and open software, whatever piece. Mm -hmm. Oh, it didn't do the balloons when I did that. But anyway, um, I guess they disable it for, for professional talk. Um, so anyway, we, um, uh, in those situations, like I feel like if, even though I'm a Mastodon kid, right? Like Mastodon does not have the same vibe as Twitter in the same way as Blue Sky kind of does for certain, for certain groups, right? Mm -hmm. Like they managed to translate their kind of shit posty kind of vibe onto Blue Sky wholesale. I think largely by just shipping the whole community out and those communities were small enough to do that. Mm -hmm. um, like I think Teapot went there. Um, what would it take for a community as big and as, as decentralized as the crypto art community to move to another platform? I mean, I've seen Farcaster is having a moment mm -hmm. right now. And uh, is that something yeah. that you could imagine happening? So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw it back to the VR conversation because I think that, like we are at the limits of what Web two can do, right? We are at the limits of what a single yeah. person on a computer can do. I can only see so much at one time, and it's the eight tweets that are on my screen at one time. It doesn't matter if you're on Warpcast or Mastodon or Blue Sky or whatever place is coming next. There's there's the reality of running a a business like a social media business, right? And it's like keeping eyes on the thing, and the right. eyes are going to go towards. Like you're going to create star systems always because it's going to be whoever can generate the most intriguing content, whoever can have the most interesting perspective is going to get more followers. Yeah. And yeah, those who do you swipe yeah. to, right? Who, yeah, who there, do you swipe into this tiny prism that you have? I don't think that there's a way around that in web two. I think the only way to do it is to embrace randomness. And that's why I've become really, I've always been really interested since I learned about it in this idea of like, like you ever read Snow Crash, the Neil Stevenson book? I believe I have. Yes. Yeah, it's I've like, dabbled uh, in Mr. Stevenson's works. Yes. Yeah, it's the the they keep, Stevenson coined the term metaverse. He provided, I think, the picture of it that most people still hold dear to. This idea of you know, if you go to the mall, you are going to be if you go out in the streets of New York. I live in Brooklyn, right? You're going to see perspectives and tastes and all sorts of things that you can't expect because there's an element of randomness to it a online ecosystem that is always on and is spatial and that allows you to jump between different things in real time alongside other people that helps preserve that randomness. And I think from that randomness, you can draw those perspectives. I, I, I don't, again, I don't think anyone's at fault here. We're using the technology that is best available yeah. to us. Like, you know, Twitter is the best connective tissue we have, but we all know its limits and in crypto, we come up against them all the time. The next right. thing doesn't exist yet. And it's not going to exist. We need the vision pros of the world to be a lot more advanced to be able to communicate the software technologies that we need to use to be together in a space where you're on Twitter, but there's also four other people next to you who you may not know. And they're commenting on what you're seeing on Twitter. And then you're interacting with them and they are going to go away and you're never going to interact with them again. And you get this element of random perspectives entering your life, which you can't get on any of these social medias by their nature. And that randomness has a, uh, has an ambience all of its own, right? Like mm -hmm. that's like, you know, it's one of the things that makes it is great is, is it's not just the components. It's the fact that you can turn a street and go from to, to from, uh, you know, uh, 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 a Latin American kind of vibe to, to a, a Japanese influence thing. Well, it's, I mean, and that it's way itself more, is a thing. Yeah. I mean, it's way more, I think even like banal than that. Like if you're at CVS and I'm picking out body wash and someone comes down the aisle and picks out a different body wash and says, Hey, you know, I used to use that. Not very great. You should check this out. All of a sudden a new Does thing has entered happen? my life. In Brooklyn? 
No, but it could. <laughs> I can sort of in see the, it, but in a less polite way. But yeah, okay, oh, yeah, well, yeah. I don't know. Like maybe I'm tired of my Dove for men's body wash, and the guy next to me, I don't know, some like tall, well built, good looking dude is buying something else, and I look over, I'm like, okay, maybe right, I'll try right, that slightly right. more expensive you, one. You should say who what that other brand is because, like, then you'll you'll get like promotion. I have it in my. I think it's called like Lumberman Jack or something like that. But I always like, <laughs> I always like almost buy it, then I'm like, ah, I'll stick with my Dove. <laughs> The, but like that, that element of randomness is everywhere. For Lumberman Jack, that's too. Or like, or like I'm going to buy a me. white onion, and then somebody looks at, like, walks by, looks at them, and is like, mm, and chooses a Spanish onion instead. Who knows? Maybe I'll choose a Spanish onion just on the sheer force of like weird interpersonal, public, like subconscious communication. If you can so, have that happen on the internet, then. Like you're- and I think I think that's one of the cultural things that's aspirational about decentralization. Like I think from an artistic, like I think there's a great essay by Dana Boyd describing the move from, and sometimes I quite think it just make me sound like 200 years old, but um, from MySpace to um, to early Facebook. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's essentially, she's a sociologist. Um, and she was like going, it's sort of like people middle-classing up, right? Like mm-hmm. MySpace was like messy and teenagery. And then when people went to college, they were like, oh, I got to, you know, use a Facebook, which is where the terminology came from. And then a lot of the pang, I feel... Um, not from technologists, but from like real people is they're like, oh, like everything's the same, like mm. Facebook's all the same, you know? Um, and so I feel like it's something we can exploit, right? I'm forever kind of going, you know, going out into a decentralized world is going out into a weird and wonderful place where all the interfaces are different and it's, it's, you know, it's a it, 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 you you turn one way and it's one way, uh, and, and you go another and it's another. Um, is that something that is more? My other worry is that we over cater to people like us, right? Mm-hmm. Like you and I are kind of addicted now to the cutting edge, right? Like we want to keep getting that high. Um, do you feel like? varieties is something that like artists and cultural critics like uh, um are particularly overexcited about and like that means you will never sell to the rest of the world and does that matter um i think it's just human nature to seek mm-hmm. variety it's like why we flip channels it's why we travel it's why we don't go to the same restaurant every night some people do they should be right. allowed to do that there will always be a version of that but like the the problem is that the thing only caters now to those people and that there is not an option to indulge in variety on the internet the way that i think we want to so it's yeah. not that i think that like we should be singularly crafting cultural taste based on our like weird cutting edge sensibilities it's that we don't have the option to, and the more options, the better. So like everyone should be able to have the, an online life that is equally attractive to them as they would like. And again, the, the options are li- so limited now that we're forced into this kind of like quasi monocultural stew right. that you should be able to turn away from if you want, or you should be able to indulge in if you want, you should be able to indulge in it one day and turn away from it the next day. Like you should be able to embrace the many facets of you and it should be reflected in the technology you use if you're going to be using it as I do for 26 hours a day. Right. I think that like that craving for variety and personality and something that matches your own unique ish aesthetics or, you know, your set of tastes just grows more and more pressing. The more people spend more time people spend in a, in a digital environment. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, it's so weird to me that like, you know, I'm talking to you through uh, a browser window here. Um, mm. And, you know, this whole thing that I'm in is like a business tool, right? Like I've got like, you know, Word or Google Docs just next to me and like my, you know, email, which I strongly associate with, you know, my work, right? Yeah. 
And like, that feels wrong, right? Like, particularly when I'm looking at art, particularly when I'm sort of um, experiencing a subculture that, that, that I see crypto art as sort of a subculture as much as anything else. And yet you're kind of having to make do with like being in that, that CBS, right? Being in that, you know, it's like having a party mm -hmm. in a Walgreens. Yeah, I mean, well, it's like every time you see a piece of art on Twitter, you're seeing it on Twitter. You have the option to like and retweet it. And maybe that's right. not the best thing. Maybe that's not the best like variety of options for seeing an artwork. Maybe it is, but like maybe another platform is going to give you an option to, I don't know, make that art, bring it into your home. I have no idea. Like, again, we're, everything is screwed by the context of which it's seen and i have i hate art museums i hate going to art museums because i'm seeing all this art in a quiet security guard laden white walled like cavernous cathedral-esque space i'm like where i that's not what art is to me it's not what it should be to me it should not be academic and boring which it is forced to be by the context of of its locale right. Right. So again, I just want more options. And I want those options to be evolving in real time. And I want those options to have options. I want to be on um, Pimp My Ride. I want to exhibit to put options in my options because he heard I liked options. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do, do you get that one? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. In the history of memes, I, I, I remember no, that exhibit. Yeah. The, so um, uh, like I feel sometimes that one of the, the, the great kind of sadnesses in a lot of spaces is that is that there's a community of people who see technology digital technology as something that lets them create and do all these kind of things because they can code right or they 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 know their way around some tools right and you know have the money to buy the thing like talking about mm -hmm. vision pro and then you have everybody else who kind of sits in that world that was created for them in mm -hmm. in the sort of tragic version um do you feel like you have access to change things the way you want it? And how, um, uh, how can we make that better for artists to make a decentralized environment more appealing than, you know, posting well, their art to Twitter? It's, that's a difficult question. Um, I'm not sure I have the vision to see the world I want to live in, the online world I want to live in, the digital world I want to live in. And without that vision, without the end goal, it's difficult to motivate myself as somebody who has zero coding experience to seek out tools that might allow me to create that world. That is right. not where my vision lies. I, you know, I'm for somebody who lives on the cutting edge, I'm kind of a traditionalist. I like my word documents and I like, you know, my, I, I won't read from an e-reader. I, I read old, I read books. Right. Right. So I think that the question for me that's more pertinent is how do we provide people the opportunity to feel confident in visions for the future and then have them seek out tools that are going to allow them to build those visions? You know, if you can't write code, you can still build things. You just, I mean, you could find a coder or there are right. tools that allow you ways around that, especially with AI. You know, the crazy right. chat GBT coding that you see now is only going to get more intense in five years. There's a possibility that all code is written via AI in three to five years, or at least yeah. a vast majority of it, especially like low level, you know, web building code. So I think yeah. it's about like teaching people that like what they might see in the future and why it would be useful to them and then get them thinking about how to go about actually producing that, but also producers of culture and it like, producers of progress are always going to be a subset of the population. Like, right. There's no way ar around that. I don't think that that's um, an elitist idea, especially if that the ability to be that kind of person is accessible, but that's always a, a percent of a percent of people who are going to say, I want to change things. I have a vision for how to change things. Let me go find out how to change things. Yeah. And I think there's no, there's no shame in, I mean, literally it's weird for me to even suggest that there is to be someone who appreciates and connects with a piece of art 
without having the skill to create that art, right? Like, you know, no, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, everything I have around me, which you can sort of see is things that I find inspiring or things that like, I love, I could never make them. That's part of the point of having them. My and mom this painted is, these. Oh, wow. Wow. They're, they're they're pretty I could, I couldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. So this is Shout interesting because I, I, th I think, I think this is sort of where I'm drilling to, which is like, in as in the art community, I think in the D web technologies community, we make things for ourselves, right? And I think that that sometimes we make things we we lean too much into okay, this has to be configurable and moldable because that's what everybody wants. And that's not wrong because you want, as you say, every anyone to be able to enter into it. That has to be as diverse as possible. But it also has to be something where people can see what they like in a museum. Well, you, you invoked or, MySpace and Facebook. That's the perfect example. Right. I right. came in just like, I, I think I was not to date myself, but I think I was like 12 or 13 when that like schism started to change from MySpace to Facebook. Right. So I got in at the end of one, the beginning of the other. And I loved MySpace, right? I remember I had right. some kind of a green background. I had the Offspring music playing on my channel. And then you, <laughs> you go to Facebook and it's – I think I went to your MySpace page actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was awesome. I just would tweet or I guess post out like ACDC lyrics and had a great time doing it. But you're right. Like the choice of MySpace, all of this customizability turned out to be the Achilles heel – People wanted yeah. the stock experience that allowed them to do things quicker, allowed them yeah. it, it sacrificed customizability for efficiency. Yeah. And like that it, but again, you should be allowed to make that choice. I there's no problem with, you know, like not driving a nineteen seventies like souped up Chevy Bel Air and just driving a Hyundai Elantra. Like that's fine. Right. It should be right. fine. That's my choice too. But again, right. you need the option to have both. So I think that like the customizability is like a, a, a there's a trickle down effect, right? The people who are building the thing have to allow for all of these different options so that versions can be created to suit all these populations right. downstream. I don't know if that at all was along the no, lines. No, no, I think that's but, right. And like applying it to art, right? Like the whole function of a movement is you know somebody disco dis discovers an aesthetic that can be explored, and then there's sort of imitation, but there's also adoption, right? Mm -hmm. I think, I think there's something here in, in particular. Um, uh, okay. So here's a bit of secret history. And I may have told this story on, on, on the podcast before, but you know, if you look at like one of the successes of decentralization is Linux, right? And it's a mixed bag, right? Because when Linux started, everyone was like, you know, Microsoft's going to collapse um, there's going to be world <laughs> domination. Everyone will use Linux and in yeah. that way. But it's interesting to watch kind of the ad 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 adoption of it, as particularly amongst you know what created the Linux nerd. And one of the big adoption moments was when I think it was GNOME, or maybe yeah, um, had like a window manager that was had a lot of, of I'm going to say rice, right? I had a lot of Chrome to it, right? And mm -hmm. in particular, you could pick up the windows, and if you moved the windows, they would wobble. Mm -hmm. And loved this. And people loved the fact that it did that, and people loved showing it to other people. And other people were like, I want that. I want, like, wobbly mm -hmm. windows. And you can get wobbly windows on Mac or Windows. So they, so, so they moved, right? And they played around with it. And this was like nerds, right? This is like, of course, the, the, the history, the mainstream history after that is like, well, I moved to Linux because, you know, it's more secure and I, you know, yeah. uh, screw Microsoft. But it was the wobbly windows that did it. And I feel like that's part of what the appeal that we can create in art and technology is to give people a sense, oh, this is an aesthetic that I kind of like. and. I do want my digital life to 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 have to be decorated in this. Um, and where do people go for art? In, for you can't know it until you see it, right? Like, right. You have to go to museums. Yeah. You have to go and like get to see this stuff on the cutting mm -hmm. edge. So, yeah. Well, I mean, cool. that's ideally what I hope that like a VR 
AR world will do for for all this digital art. You'll be able to see art that you've never like consciously considered before. I mean, we're surrounded by digital art all the time. We just never really categorize it as such. I don't know. Maybe it's about just seeing more art in spaces that say this is art and then you can consider it. But like, right. It's all over the place. It's our dominant, like cultural communication form already, but people don't see it in spaces where it, it, it looks yeah. at you and it says, no, no, this thing over here, this is art. This, this isn't thing, a product. This thing you're looking might, at it's right a, now. Yeah, exactly. Is, is, uh, yeah, right. You know, you're seeing it in the lobby of a building that you're going into in Midtown, New York but you're not considering it as art. You're considering it as like wallpaper. Yeah. But like Andy Warhol created wallpaper that declared itself to be art. So, you know, you need someone to like wobble the windows before you say, Oh, actually I didn't realize windows could wobble. I never thought about the tactility of a window before. Yeah. I never thought I cared about these things. Yeah. Well, we're, 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 we're coming to the end. Um, so if anybody wants to look in through your wobbly window, that's a terrible segue. If anybody wants to go to Mocha, um, uh, what's the URL? Oh, we have a couple. We have museumofcryptoart.com is where kind of everything lives. We have app.museumofcryptoart.com, which is where you'll see all of our collections and all the other kind of like toolkits that we provide um, for the community, all of our rooms, the metaverse galleries, all the like curational tools that we provide, all the writing. Um, we're at Museum of Crypto on Twitter. Twitter, not For X. now. Uh, for now. Um we have a Substack if you want to check out our writing, which we do every week. That's museumofcrypto.substack.com. Uh, what else? What do you, you should check out the Mocha Live podcast. You can just search up you MOCA should. Live on Spotify or Apple, wherever you get your podcasts. We do one of those every week on Wednesdays, usually at 5 p.m. But see our Twitter feed. We have like lovely graphics made by the wonderful Lulu Collages. Uh, yeah. You can start artist. with the, the, our interview where I swear even more than I do in this. Um, I don't think we swore one time on this podcast. I said bastardization once and I was like, I don't know if that's going to fly. I, there was a weird thing at the beginning where I sort of went, holy cow. And I was like, it's mm. actually okay to swear on this podcast. I just feel like I was like, I was so sweary in our one that I'm like, oh no, this is my On the Local Live podcast, job. we swear as much as uh, yeah, our guest it was, I, I recognize that. So for all your swearing needs, go to go to mocha live on wherever you uh you subscribe to your podcast thanks very much thanks Max. yeah i appreciate and, it Danny. this um, was fun yeah uh, stay in touch yeah i hope Good so night. take care everyone bye-bye bye